Well, this really says it all. I found out that Modern Warfare 2 was getting a remaster on the 1st of April. So imagine my surprise when I go to start making this video and find out that it is an actual thing that was released a couple weeks back. Well, I already bought the game on sale a while ago, and I'm not buying it again. If it's just a graphical update, then I'll probably just say it was a shame for all those artists who likely worked hard to have their work replaced by art that will be outdated in 10 years and need another remaster. Let's take this opportunity to talk about 2009's Blockbuster video game. Blockbuster doesn't really seem an appropriate term for video games, especially with the advent of digital sales and also the country still being on lockdown as of writing this. Activision made the smart marketing decision of abandoning the numbers in their titles as it would become apparent how manufactured the series was to be so quickly ballooning in total number count. Yet, this game is going to be in an awkward position when the inevitable sequel to Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 comes out. Not to be confused with Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the sequel to Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. And I just realized that Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare remaster was titled Call of Duty Modern Warfare remaster, dropping the number, meaning in 2027 when it is remastered again to update the graphics it will be titled Call of Duty Modern Warfare remastered remaster and two years later call of duty modern warfare will get its first remaster which will be titled call of duty modern warfare remastered and then a few years later if there will be call of duty modern warfare 2 remastered remastered endless trash also yes they really did put a title drop in the opening of this game it's sort of a warning against titling something the definitive modern edition for something that can be so easily outdated, but that said, has modern warfare the concept and the game changed meaningfully in such a way that it needs to be remastered for a whole new generation? Well, by now, someone will have said the obvious that nobody plays these games for the single player, which would be an agreeable thesis if it weren't for the fact that Activision was focusing their remastering efforts on the campaign. So joke's on you. I guess the campaign is relevant after all. That, or they don't want to split their player base and recognize that they can't put microtransactions in a remaster. Yet. <sighs> This game was a nightmare. We open with a horrifying resolution and disturbing content warning. Not that the warning is disturbing, but that it is a warning of disturbing content. And I will say, have you noticed what's missing here? I don't seem to see an options menu on this screen here. That is disturbing. So we get to watch this unskippable cutscene in 1024 by 768 and only have options once we get into the game proper. Wow, one of the few things I praised Modern Warfare for, and this game fails at it. And it's needless too, because the cutscene attempts a summary of the previous game's plot. There's no reason you couldn't have gone straight to main menu and then played this when people started the campaign after setting their options. Please let the player configure their game before you start jamming content down their gullet. I'm putting myself in the shoes of someone who starts the series here, and I'm finding myself more confused than enlightened as to what the plot might have been. None of this cutscene really matters until the end here. We are five years after the events of the first game. It's always five years. Offense, but I see a lot of you guys firing from the hip and spraying bullets all over the range. You don't end up hitting the damn thing, and it makes you look like an ass. That's right, only rookies who play old first person shooters shoot from the hip. Not that what he's trying to demonstrate here really pans out, considering I can hit these targets just as well from the hip as with the sights, because they're really close. Also, I always thought the characters in these games weren't hip firing. They had their weapons shouldered. They just weren't aiming down their sights. Are they actually supposed to be hip firing? We get a repeat of the training mission from the previous game, albeit a far less interesting version that gets reused in Spec Ops as its first mission, so don't waste your time trying to perfect it here. And we are so exceptional at it that the narrator, General Shepard, reassigns us to the Special Forces Group, Task Force 141, and our skills with the gun gets us sent undercover. But first we gotta fight in the Middle East. No joke, I have no idea where we are or why we're here. These are obviously the weird communist Arabs from the first game, but why we're still invading this country after five years and a nuclear bombing is beyond me. Oh wait, it's because commentary. Smash cut to our next protagonist, another Task Force 141 member, alongside... Soap McTavish? Who's so? Was the SAS disbanded into a generic US task force at the end of Modern Warfare? Or did Soap immigrate to the United States between games? And, um, I don't remember him having such a strong accent, or any accent, but I could believe the Mohawk. Soap alone was personally responsible for over 500 people dying in the last game. And, well, I can easily say that we kill 
much more than that in this game. Although spoilers, both of these protagonists will die. In very similar ways, might I add. Yeah, the first game may have done that, but this is the second game, and that means twice as many dead protagonists. I never played the third game, does that one kill six? So we go through an ice climbing section here, which is teaching the player an important lesson that will come up later, so be sure to write this down. And that's where we get the heartbeat sensor. Yes, it is stupid, we all know this, and it's not terribly useful either. I suspect that because the multiplayer had to be balanced around this thing, that meant it had to be somewhat useless. But that means it was more of a burden than an interesting new gameplay mechanic. It could have attempted to make up for the game's awful attempts at stealth, but the game doesn't do stealth sections as often as the first, so it's pretty much a pointless gimmick. We walk through the base, quite easily in fact, but the script says that we have to get caught. Now a word about this scene. Soap gets caught doing something, and we stay out of sight until the right moment where we blow a C4 charge that creates an opening for our escape. Except the first time through, I listened to what Soap said and stayed in this back room, at which point Soap was executed. I was waiting for a signal like you said, but of course the game wants me to go out here on this balcony so we can witness the explosion when it goes off, instead of doing the logical thing which would be to stay in the room until the diversion starts and then leave. I gotta respect the hustle, risking your life in order to get those cinematic shots for your subordinates. This game is obsessed with cinema. We got another game whose main theme was by Hans Zimmer, which of course means the title music while the rest is done by somebody else. Hey Lorne Balf. And no music slider, not that you'd want it, the game without music would just be gunshots and people yelling at you to do stuff. There was a point where I thought the game had an intense bass section, but actually it was just the sound of AAA fire in the distance. Pretty awesome when your OST leaves the same impression as white noise. There were a few times I had to take breaks because of the audio. This is why you have sliders, because otherwise I have to keep the audio loud to hear the quietest part. I can't ignore it anymore, we have to talk about the snowmobile chase. It's thoughtful, it's gritty, it's realistic, it has a 100 foot snowmobile jump with an explosion to punctuate the landing, and of course, it's just a set piece. It's not like snowmobile racing was the new game mode of Modern Warfare 2's multiplayer, although the level does get used twice in the spec ops, so I'm guessing this was Gary's prototype for a first person snowmobile game that didn't get the green light by the Activision execs. And you know what? I rescind my criticism. I support the snowmobile racing, I hope Gary gets to make his project a reality. I see those stupid vehicle set paces in the games emulating this one and I'm always disappointed because they don't embrace the stupid. We should be upping the ante with 500 foot dirt bike jumps over volcanoes. Now hold on to your asses, I'm about to say something positive about the first game. See, it had this thing called pacing. It's a forbidden writer's technique where you have slow sections around the action to give the player a break because otherwise the game is just a smear of nonsense. We go from being knocked out for zero reason in Middle Eastistan to gunning Arabs down with a minigun to ice pick climbing to airfield shooting to snowmobile chase to to a shootout in a favela and there is nary a moment to reflect on what is happening. And every time the game does partition a slow section, it's usually very short and something ends up going wrong so the action can start right back up again. It was my choice to mess up all gillied up. If you play the section the way it's intended, it's a slow but tense section punctuated between two action-based levels. Wait, why is all gillied up a spec op mission? And more importantly, why was it backwards? The real question is, if we're going to abandon realism and slow pacing, why don't we make the game actually fun to play? To start, we could put a number on the screen that indicates how much health the player has, or even just a bar that vaguely shows how much there is, and not smear jam over the player's screen to esoterically refer to your health. You see, chaotic isn't bad. I've had lots of fun playing games that are chaotic. The problem is that chaos in Call of Duty tends to involve a lot of sitting behind walls looking at my phone while I wait for my health to come back. Wait. 
The infamous no Russian level has been greatly misspelled. It's meant to be spelled no Russian, as in enjoy walking through this slow ass segment as we try to shock you. Damn, here I was minding my own business, just enjoying my second amendment rights. Do all these people look alike or what? It's like a movie. No, no, shut up. They think that's praise. No Russian is a bad level. Not because of any controversy, I'm completely for games being controversial and doing edgy shit even if just for the sake of it. Better if it has something intelligent to say. I don't think No Russian is a particularly intelligent level and here are my issues. 1. The sequence feels contrived. The nuke scene in the first Modern Warfare shocked people because morons think killing your protagonist is groundbreaking, so they came at it from the angle that they needed something like that again to stir up controversy. I refer you to the marketing for Dante's Inferno if you don't believe that this could happen. I'm strong in my headcanon that the level idea came first and the game was then structured around justifying it. 2. Yes, the player can get through the level without shooting any civilians. Infinity Ward does not get a medal for not putting the prompt press F to murder civilians on the screen and forcing players to press F. Makarov doesn't make any remarks whether you go along with it or hold your fire, so the nuance isn't that you can play pretend terrorist without doing any real harm. The nuance is that it's interactive. Well, it's a video game. But you could do so much more with that interactivity. They don't. It was also a critical part of their defense against dangerous levels of controversy by saying it was optional to participate in the shooting, both with the content warning and in-game. 3. The sequence lacks believable context. That's not to say there is no context, there is, but it's not very good. So, following the end of Modern Warfare, Zakaev is dead. But I guess the commies lost the war anyways and now Russia is an ultranationalist state that idolizes Zakaev. So, Makarov, who was apparently cut content from the first game, decides to get revenge by instigating a war between Russia and the US. And his plan to do this, mind, is to fake a mass spree killing at a Russian airport and blame Americans for it. Proudly made in the USA, baby. And apparently, everyone forgot to take their brain medicine that day and... believed it. What is the game trying to say here? That terrorists will target innocent people? True, but usually there's an ethnic, religious, or ideological bent to it. Makarov here is gunning down his fellow Russians, the countrymen whom the guy he wants revenge for wanted to uplift and protect. Actually, since it's an airport, shouldn't the death count have dozens of country civilians caught in the crossfire, including presumably Americans? I guess it's lucky for Makarov that it was just Russians at the airport that day, otherwise there might have been an international investigation that would have taken into account that the man in question had just been assigned to an undercover operation. The point of the attack is to blame America for a mass shooting as a pretense for Russia invading the US. You might be waiting for a punchline that is not going to come. Russia, a country that in-universe had in less than a decade been engulfed in a debilitating civil war that resulted in a regime change which occurred after another regime change dating back to 1991 and the fall of the Soviet Union is going to invade the United States. Is the point that terrorism could be used to false flag war into being? Is Activision implying that this is America being fed its own medicine? Are the writers at Infinity Ward suggesting that 9-11 might have been fabricated to justify prolonged military invasions of multiple countries? We are reaching dangerous levels of woke here. I might get this video taken down. A few points here. We were already in Afghanistan prior to 9-11, and we justified the invasion of Iraq based on falsified reports of weapons of mass destruction, but also on the previous war with Iraq. In fact, 9-11 had more to do with stripping Americans of our own rights and putting us in the mood for war than it did actually giving us a target. But to perfect this masterpiece of political fiction is that Russia used a MacGuffin called an ACS in order to bypass our defenses and teleport into the US. That's why we had the stealth mission in Kazakhstan. Please in your sector, please verify. Very funny station. That's a big negative over. That's just the official story given. Honestly, this cutscene makes it look more like it was the satellite operator's disbelief at the number of aircraft en route that allowed them to bypass our defenses than them somehow hacking the system. The game makes it look like it takes a couple of seconds for them to just fly on over here. And the game doesn't stop. Part of the reason No Rushing fails is because the game does not give the player an opportunity to reflect on its events. Right after we get done with the civilian murdering, we immediately go back to gunfighting by engaging some Russian police. There's barely a second's pause before the action kicks right back in again. Even after the mission is over, we don't get a segment to pause and reflect on what happened a slow 15 or 20 minute comm mission before the storm. 
No, we get a protracted gunfight spanning an entire Brazilian favela. Here's the thing, right? Shocking imagery is kind of like a bruise, in that it doesn't become apparent how bad the injury was until you've had some time to heal. I, however, am merciful, so you're free to cogitate for a bit while I go over some gun autism in this game. The big thing that stands out to me is the number of Russian soldiers carrying various NATO weapons. It's like, yeah, they aren't American guns and we made all these weapons for the multiplayer, so just give them to the Russians. And even then, the Russian guns are all 50 years out of date. Russians using AK-47s, yes, AK-47s, not AKMs or 74s, let alone anything on the modern AK platform. I think the FNFAL is the worst defender considering it was the NATO flagship battle rifle. Maybe somebody at Infinity Ward was like, eh, AK is in 762, so the FAL, so it must be Russian. Although the big question mark for me is why the FAL used this extended mag release in order to break the mags off when reloading. Yeah, that's a defining feature of the AK platform, yet the 47 doesn't have it. Look, here's some H3 VR to demonstrate the idea. These are not exactly the right guns, but the idea is still the same. But yeah, the Russians are using AUGs, G36s, UMP45s, P90s, and even the L85. The British Special Forces guys use American guns, while the Russians are using British guns. It's just all wrong. Most surprising to me, however, is that I have a favorite weapon. I didn't think I could, considering the only thing that separates most of them is the sound they make. But this short double barrel shotgun here, the Ranger, it's fun. Each mouse button gets a barrel instead of having a name function, so naturally, it only appears in one level, where it isn't entirely ideal to use. No, no, thank God we have 50 versions of the same basic ray-casted assault rifle blueprint to tide us over for the rest of the game. There's the G17 that's been made full auto and called a G18. There's the 1911 that still looks like it hasn't had a texture update since COD 2. There's the USP 45 with a knife in hand. Here's what reloading that would look like. But hey, it has faster melee attacks, so it's tactic cool. Of course, we get a repeat of the Desert Eagle, but it's now joined by a 44 Magnum on the list of cool looking guns that are impractical to use in a game used by the villains. Anyways, your government-mandated break is over. Back to the stupidity. An amusing part of the invasion of the US is that all the American troops have managed to also teleport back to the United States. The Army Rangers unit we were saddled with in the beginning teleports back from the Middle East to the East Coast. One would think that Task Force 141, some of the West's allegedly best special forces, would be involved in the defense of the US, maybe protecting the president or something. Nah, they're in Brazil getting gangbanged. This level has a beautiful moment. We spend several minutes climbing this favela, going through hell, fighting people that are completely unrelated to the plot. I will remind you that this is minutes after the player was just compelled to spray down a group of civilians, and now we're on the opposite side of the globe fighting criminals. The justification being Makarov bought his bullets from the guy we're after, which is stupid. They're bullets. I recently bought a box of a thousand rounds of the same stuff Makarov used to shoot up an airport on the internet. The only reason you would go to an arms dealer is to make the rounds more difficult to trace in order to obfuscate your identity, but the goal of the attack was to implicate the US by using American rounds. So wouldn't you pay some guy in Alaska a couple thousand bucks to hook you up with American rounds instead of some guy in Brazil? Is this wanted weapons of fate logic where every bullet is stamped with a signature of the secret society that created it for some reason? So we go through this favela of desaturated colors and the whole time we're chasing this guy in soap and gas, sorry, soap and ghost. He's cool because he has a school on his mask and not a ball cap. 
They're shouting on the radio about how good a level they're getting to play while we're stuck with this horse shit, but we finally catch up to the guy and Soap catches him instead. It's a beautiful moment because the player is almost never given any of the moments in this game, unlike the first one. You're always the accessory to somebody else's antics. Here's the thing. While America is burning down, we're in Brazil trying to catch this guy for next to no reason. I don't even remember what the key piece of information he gives us is supposed to be, but it's not important. This level exists as a set piece to justify the multiplayer having stuff like a double barrel shotgun in the model 1887, which is a really bad reason to include a level. Like, you guys can just include guns for fun. And then another beautiful moment, we go to escape, but in a twist, we fall off the edge and don't get caught. Only for it to be like 30 seconds of getting shot at and then we jump for the helicopter again and I arbitrarily failed for the first time. So, once again, we have a set piece added that adds no bearing to the plot. Granted, I'm glad it isn't to justify having three or four more levels about escaping Brazil, Battlefield 3 style, but at the same time, the game would have been better off if it just cut this and had us escape the first time. Back in America, we play as Ramirez. He's the third protagonist, who actually lives to see the end of this game, surprise surprise. And I guess Ramirez and Sergeant Foley don't get along because Foley has Ramirez doing all the dangerous work. Get used to characters shouting your name the entire time. There was only one moment in the game where I realized that another character had been told over the radio to do something. Every other time, it was us. We fight through some suburbs, we fight at some fast food joints, we fight over a VIP who I don't know because the game doesn't tell us how VI this P is, we fight in the Man Mansion Park, and I think the setting of fighting Russians on US turf is interesting enough. It's definitely different compared to most of the blown out buildings I'm used to playing these games in, but there is a contrast that I don't think was intentional. We go from fighting in third world hovels to defending a much more lavish first world homes. And the game is brave enough to have us gun down Russian civilians or fight around Brazilian civilians, but you best believe there is not a single American civilian in sight. Because this game only wants to be controversial in the ways that it's comfortable with. One problem is that I never understood the Russians' plan, which, to be fair, neither did the writers. They're all going to jump out of airplanes and start, what, gunning down American civilians? What about their supply lines? What territory are they occupying? What's their long-term strategy? Do they just plan on getting revenge and then going home with zero retaliation or consequences? How are they going to get home? Was it a one-way trip? Did they know it was one way? Are they going to re-annex Alaska? Moreover, I never got over the feeling that these were just reskinned generic enemy AI from the first game. This didn't feel like I was fighting a modern military that was supposed to be an equal opponent for America. All that's really different is that they can go prone sometimes now. They still rush out into the open in Congo lines even after watching their comrades get gunned down doing the exact same thing. They still spam RPGs and grenades like savages. And the friendly AI is hardly any more intelligent. Multiple times I noticed level progress would come to a screeching halt because one enemy would entrench themselves behind a wall and the AI would patiently wait for me to take point because they needed that enemy to be dead to proceed but couldn't personally shoot them. I think the worst part, besides the Russians using NATO weapons, is that they use American weapons. Yes, there is a point where Russians are using javelins and M82 sniper rifles. Now, maybe they are using confiscated American weapons. That might be a fair argument. But more likely is that the designers didn't want to implement Russian equivalents to these weapons and just got lazy. Now you might be thinking, America's under attack, so where's Task Force 141? Shouldn't they be rescuing the president or Congress or something important? They're leading the counterattack into eastern Russia, so it is kind of important. Seems like the worst place to start a counter invasion, though. It's a shame America in this timeline has no allies in Europe that could spring pad an invasion to Russia's key cities. I'm sure the Russians were surprised America even fought back. I mean, why would America be allowed to? They don't have the Casus Belli. We dive to an oil rig where some SAM sites are set up, and the Russians have apparently taken the rig workers hostage. Wait, Jesus, aren't the rig workers Russians? Oh god, it keeps happening. Yes, of course the Russians took the rig workers hostage. Because they aren't a modern military comparable to America, the reskinned Arabs from the first game. Wait, is this reverse diegesis? Is the retarded AI bleeding into the story? I mean, come on, I know Russians are a little looser with the value of human life, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't just station soldiers on the rigs and let the workers work. Why? Oh why? Are the rooms rigged to explode with hostages tied up and blindfolded? I think that's bad for the soldiers, too. You might have noticed these fancy new breaching sequences. Yeah, it's a fun gimmick, but repeat it 10 times in 4 hours and it gets a little tiring. After taking out the rigs, we proceed with our next mission. To go to THE Gulag. To rescue the man that caused this war. Oh. I just remembered the key piece of information we got in Brazil. I didn't remember it because it makes the Brazil section even worse. 
The man that motivated Makarov to cause this whole kerfuffle is the guy that killed Zakaev. That's right. So, McTa I mean, Captain Price. Wait, you needed some guy in Brazil to tell you that? Shouldn't Soap and Gaz know? It, wait, what the fuck? Why is Captain Price in Russian prison? If he got caught at the end of the last game, then shouldn't Soap be here too? Or is he in super jail for unrelated reasons that happened in between games? Or, and this is a crazy theory, he was added because the game needed a second act twist and a callback to a classic character. So yeah, we're here to bust out Captain Price and the characters are very particular about making sure not to say that's the reason we're here, lest the player find out this totally epic reveal. Price is busted out and immediately starts giving input on how to solve World War III. Slow down there, buddy. You just escaped the gulag. Maybe you should rehabilitate for a little while. Maybe a couple stiff drinks. He suggests the nuclear option. On the United States. Yes, it's actually brilliant. The world was dumb enough to believe America shot up the airport when it was secretly Russian, so I'm sure they would totally believe the Russians nuked America when it was secretly Americans. This batshit plan should have been grounds to throw Price in a padded cell, but instead he gets to join Task Force 141 for their next mission. Price cuts the radio with General Shepard and then, surprised Pikachu face, boards the next nuclear submarine we come across and fires a nuke at America. And then Soap and Gaz have the gall to pretend to be shocked that this man that just suggested the nuclear option actually went through with it, and nobody here stops and thinks, hey, didn't we just commit treason? Surely there will be consequences for this in the future, right? Maybe we should make a point of telling Shepard that we aren't associated with this man or his actions. Cut the first person POV of an astronaut getting nuked. Neat angle, I guess. Kind of out of left field, though. I guess this is the successor to President Al whoever from the first game who got killed as another body for the dead protagonist pile. Back in America, before the nuking, we find some people at the Washington Memorial. Everyone laments the lines about the National Guard fighting at the evac center getting cut, and we go through a helicopter sequence before the inevitable happens. This is it. The Rangers are overwhelmed by seemingly endless Russians. Everyone's remarking on being out of ammo, which is amazing considering I was almost consistently at over 500 rounds of it and at points reached over a thousand. This game seriously has no restraint about how much ammo the player can carry, except for now, suddenly, everything goes south and I'm just thinking to myself, we could have diegetically reinforced this point instead of just fucking arbitrarily drawing it up. Surprise's so big plan was to EMP the East Coast. He doesn't explain the logic of it, and it's a really stupid plan. See, the game gets right that all aircraft start crashing in an EMP because their electronic systems go offline. There's also neat details like optics and radios that stop working, and people have trouble identifying one another. The EMP section is done really well. But getting here is stupid. Because it's not just going to be Russian aircraft that go down when the EMP goes off, there's already American aircraft here and American soldiers flying back to America, and Russian soldiers already on the ground. It's been long enough that they set up vehicles and turret emplacements. The way I see it, throwing an EMP into the mix is only going to level the playing field in favor of the Russians. This is yet another instance of a decision being guided by marketing and level designers rather than competent writing. And I want to say, again, that the EMP section was probably the highlight of the game. There was a lot of work that was put into making this level that makes it feel great. It's very atmospheric. Everyone's using runners to communicate now. The call sign is established early and reused multiple times in encounters. There's a moment where some Russian soldiers are trying to free trap drivers in Russian vehicles. Everything is dark and it starts raining. And I think, even with this stupid plot, that if every level had the care of this level, it could have been so much better. The Rangers side of the story ends with the player waving green flares atop the White House to signal that American troops are still fighting. This leads into the final act of Modern Warfare 2 and boy is it silly. General Shepard, notably concerned about the whole nuking America thing, sends the main characters involved in the situation on two separate suicide missions. Although they're not suicide missions up front obviously. Gaz and the player go to a Russian safe house used by Makarov while Price and Soap go to Afghanistan. We get some intel, and as soon as we go to leave...
my involvement is is nothing. Brutal. Both Roach and Private. Um, you know, I was gonna do a ruffle notes thing, but I actually think I did that in the last video. So, Private Allen gets betrayed and shot by an antagonist in their escape vehicle. Yeah, it turns out that the whole treason thing didn't get let off softly. I can't even hate General Shepard for this. It's perfectly reasonable to send these men on suicide missions and then kill them if they manage to survive. Soap McTavish is this universe's most lethal man. Roach is following in his footsteps, Gaz is a zombie, and Price went insane and nuked America. There's no possible way you could see this as a betrayal, but rather the only intelligent way that Shepard could possibly stop these dangerous men. But, well, Shepard shot the cool skull face man, so now he has to die. Meanwhile, Soap and Price survived their side of the betrayal, somehow. This mission here is pretty cool, if only because I enjoy the level 2 betrayals from Halo and this is pretty much the same idea. With Roach dead, we're once again in the body of Soap, robbing him of any of his personality. We escape thanks to Nikolai. You know, he was an informant in the first game. I don't know how he's suddenly some international information and weapons broker. Oh god, it's wanted logic again. Other than this situation needs a character like this and we don't know anybody else who could fill the role. So, it's time for revenge and a totally one-way mission. We will definitely not be seeing Nikolai rescue us at the end of this. I wonder where Sergeant Karamov is. I guess he was probably executed after the Ultranationalists won the Civil War. Final level, finally. It's edgy too. We're killing real deal American soldiers. I didn't think that was legal, but it's okay. They're evil. I mean, they are Task Force 141, our former comrades as of like 30 minutes ago, and we're the ones who pointlessly committed treason, but hey, Shepard shot the skull face man, so now we have the license to kill Americans without moral panic. This level, unwittingly, tells a diegetic story. Soap and Price are so deadly that we wipe out entire squads of these Special Forces guys, to the point that Shepard calls a danger close fire mission on himself and his own men on the off chance that it will kill one of us. And they still have the same AI, the same Imperial Guardsman tactics, the same lack of self-preservation. And it just keeps going. Shepard boards a helicopter, so we take a boat and give chase. We are completely unkillable. Q boat chase sequence. Not that first person boating is the game's new multiplayer mode, it's just here for this set piece. I guess this was Kyle's pet project that got shot down. Price shoots down Shepard, but not before we send the boat over a waterfall and it ends in this dramatic scene. The player gets stuck with a knife because Shepard is somehow more badass than Soap and Price combined, and as we lay there, dying, we go for the gun. Suddenly, a lesson taught early returns to the game and the controls. They are familiar. Wordlessly taught, the seed that was planted has become the mighty oak tree. The player crawls with the same controls that they climb the ice. It paid off in the quick time final boss fight. Of course, I have to wonder how Soap is crawling with that knife stuck in his chest. Anyways, we pull it out, which is... A very annoying button mashing sequence, by the way, and chuck it at Shepard, nailing him in the eye, and ending the game with Nikolai, who totally promised this would be a one-way trip, ensuring that there will be a sequel. Dot, dot, dot. One would think that the villain of the game would be the guy responsible for the disturbing warning content by shooting up that entire airport of civilians. Weird how it was General Shepard. So what did General Shepard want? He loosely outlines his stated mission goals. He's bothered that 30,000 of his men died in a nuclear explosion in Modern Warfare 1, even though it was mostly the Marines who were there and some Navy and Air Force people. In fact, the Army was the only one not explicitly stated to have been there, so not 30,000 of your men, unless you were being possessive of the entire military. 
Anyways, Shepard must have had a hard time with recruiting quotas considering his plan was pretty much manufacture conflict to get people enlisting. Actually, that stupid theory might explain why British SAS forces were now fixtures of an American task force. But the game never stops and says that America has had a hard time filling boots ever since 30,000 people got wiped out in a nuclear attack. And America doesn't seem to be having that big an issue considering the game opens with an invasion of a Middle Eastern country. And you would think that recruiting would have done wonders after the nuclear bombing, considering you'd have a whole generation of people who'd want revenge. But really, was that it? You engineered a foreign invasion of your home country to get people enlisting? You intentionally gave Makarov the piece he needed to complete his stupid terrorism plot to cause a war to get more soldiers? I'm pretty sure more than 30,000 Americans are gonna die in World War III. I just, I don't understand. Maybe it was Megiddo. A lot of things are explained if we bring back that stupid interconnected plotline theory. At some point following the first modern warfare, Paris and New York got nuked, increasing world tensions. Splinter Cell Conviction culminates in an EMP going off in DC, which is the same EMP as in this game. The Illuminati, in an effort to impeach the first female president, got General Shepard to orchestrate a plot to cause World War III. Hitman Absolution and Bioshock are part of this because the plasmids in Bioshock made everybody stupid in Hitman in this game, leading to the eventual alien invasion of Crisis 2. So stupid. Modern Warfare 2 campaign is completely irrelevant to the success of the game in our culture. That's why remastering the campaign is such a strange decision, because it's not the campaign that people are remembering fondly. I mean, some people do, you know, people with bad taste. But I am fully aware that the multiplayer is what people really remember Modern Warfare 2 for. The game came at the right time to take advantage of the rising medium of online content creation. With the peak of the 7th console generation and esports becoming a thing, Modern Warfare 2 was ultimately in the right place at the right time in order to become a breakout success. And the tragic thing is, they could have done anything with the game and been successful. As long as a good multiplayer was attached, the single player division could have worked with zero oversight and the game would have printed money. But Activision did what they felt was safest to make as much money as possible. No Russian was manufactured outrage. In terms of actually making edgy statements, Modern Warfare 2 is lacking. It's not prepared to actually explore its concepts or be creative with its idea in any meaningful way. It doesn't have anything to say about modern warfare. What's amusing is that the special ops, like the deniable ops of Splinter Cell Conviction fame, are more amusing than the campaign. I think in part because they embrace the arcadey nature of the game. I genuinely enjoyed many of these ops, even if most of them were just taken from the single player campaign. They don't have to try to tell a story, they're just the game trying to have fun. If you aren't prepared to tell a story, let alone utilize interactivity to tell your story, then they might be better off if you don't. I actually don't think there would be anything wrong if, in lieu of the convoluted mess every time, we got a grab bag of missions and various scenarios that could explore the ideas the game wants to explore without contriving a reason to connect them all together.